Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that knows that fishing ain't what it used to be. Here is the captain. Yeah, ever since that SOB stole my boat, it's good to be seen. It's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today we are featuring Sweet Magnolias, done right by our friends at the brewery. This is an imperial stout aged in bourbon barrels with bananas, Madagascar, vanilla beans, and Nilla wafers added. You came looking for a killer, and we brought the Nilla. Garage grade, a solid five out of five bottle caps, and let's give some praise and thank you to our friends for helping us out here in the garage. First up, a cheers to Jerry in Memphis, Tennessee. A shout out to Tony in San Antonio, Texas. And a long distance cheers goes out to Bryce in Coquitlam, British Columbia. And a big we like your jib to Kristen in St. Paul, Minnesota. Here's a big southern cheers that we're sending to Julie in Leander, Texas. And last but certainly not least, we have Jake listening in Los Angeles, California. We want to thank everybody that helped us out with this week's beer fund because Without all of you, we would just be two thirsty guys sitting in a garage. That's right. We would be super thirsty. So thanks for helping out with the B-W-E-R-U-N beer run. And if you need more True Crime Garage, and I know you do, I know you're looking for it underneath your bed, underneath your closet, underneath that pile of dirty clothes, pick those up and do some laundry because you stink, my friend. You need to get off the record on Stitcher Premium. And if you don't, we can't be friends. I can't drink any more of your mother's lemonade. And that is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. When we were wrapping up yesterday's episode, Captain, we started talking about possible persons of interest or at least people that the police told the public they were looking for, people that they wanted to interview. And this came in the form of some names as well as descriptions of unknown individuals. We need to start diving into some of these people that they were talking about at the top of today's show. One of the individuals that they were looking for was a 23-year-old convicted sex offender who later would be known as a person of interest in this case. And his name is Lee Allen Wu, 23 years old, convicted sex offender. Now, they have not specifically announced or addressed any direct connection between this Lee Allen Wu and Leanna Warner. However, they said that he became a person of interest, one, because of his criminal background, and two, because he stole a vehicle on the same day that Leanna disappeared and operated that vehicle with a uh, expired license or invalid license at the time. Of course, when you have somebody with a criminal background and it is a sex offense, you have a little girl who goes missing, a guy that's known to be in the area, and he steals a vehicle on that day and chooses to break other laws, you want to know as an investigator why. Why on this day did you feel the need to steal a vehicle and operate illegally operate a vehicle? Authorities also asked for help in locating John Bartell, who they said was not a suspect. All we know about him is that police said that he was known to travel between Chisholm and the Twin Cities. They were also looking for a Bruce William Christensen of Hibbing, Minnesota. He was not a suspect, but could have vital information in the case. Bruce Christensen had 17 criminal cases filed against him between the years of 1997 and 2006, so a busy guy. He eventually went to prison for robbery, where he beat a fellow inmate to death with a piece of railing that he broke off in order to use as a weapon. He was sentenced to an additional 30 years for that murder. 
An article about his sentencing says that in September of 2003, he pled guilty to making terrorist threats against Kaylin Warner. Very interesting. Sounds like a piece of shit. 2003, September, he pled guilty to making terrorist threats against the mother of Leanna Warner. Christensen apparently blamed Kaylin for the police interest in him in Leanna's case and threatened to shoot her. Scumbag. We don't know if there was any direct connection between Kaylin Warner and this guy, but he attempted to attack a prosecutor in court and was subject to several mental health evaluations around the same time. Yeah, a real piece of shit. So it sounds to me, Captain, like when police ask you that horrible question that that nobody wants to be asked, do you know anybody that would want to harm your family or hurt your child or would have any reason to... Uh, do something against your family. I don't know this to be the case, but I'm wondering if this man, for whatever reason, was somebody that was named by the family Mm -hmm. because it seems like he wanted revenge or to retaliate against the Warner family, specifically Kalen, uh, for the police interest in him. Yeah, but it shows you the reason why they're looking at you because you go on to threaten the mother. It's like, look, if you had nothing to do with it, it's like, look, I'm, I'm willing to cooperate. I'm willing to answer your questions. I had nothing to do with this. Yeah, he's definitely a violent man at the end of the day, no doubt about that. Sean Burtek, who we referenced in yesterday's episode, was arrested on July 10th. Burtek was arrested on outstanding warrants rather than anything to do with Leanna Warner's case, but he was one of the individuals that they named at that press conference as having an interest in speaking with. But while police did confirm that Burtek was a convicted sex offender, they said that after interviewing him, he was being considered more of a witness than a suspect. We see that in a lot of cases when somebody goes missing or or there's possibly a crime within the area, they do the old pedo roundup. They realize some of these guys are not registered correctly. Some of these guys have warrants and they make arrests. And so there's a lot of arrests that are that have nothing to do with the disappearance, but that's just a byproduct of, of this girl going missing. Right on. These are issuing and um, carrying out outstanding warrants on this guy. And then after you speak with him, you, you can tell that he was in the area and you could probably back up what he was doing and his whereabouts during that time. So he, like anybody else in that neighborhood or that, that general area, would be now witness status. Of course, in any missing child case, investigators would not be doing their job if they did not take a hard look at those with the easiest access to the missing child. And of course, we're talking about the family. Authorities said fairly quickly that they were comfortable with what the family was telling them, that Leanna disappeared while away from home and they had nothing to do with it. In fact, they don't seem to have suspected the parents at all, or if they did, it was very brief and behind the scenes. Reports indicate that the Warners were not asked to take polygraphs, as you pointed out, Captain. But the fact is, Kalen Warner was one of the last people to see Leanna. Leanna could have returned home after finding that the quirks were out, putting her home by 520 or so. If that were the case, then what happened? Her mother didn't call police until 8.48 p.m., and we know that based off of the phone records and everybody else involved in this case. So what do we know about the Warners? The media covering the case revealed that Kaylin and Chris had been married before, and there was some indication of turmoil in at least one of their relationships. The year before Leanna was born in 1998, Chris Warner and his ex-wife got into a violent confrontation involving blows. Both sought mutual restraining orders, and Chris's ex maintaining that he had an uncontrollable temper. Chris's petition for a restraining order stated that his ex-wife had threatened Kaylin and her two daughters from a her previous marriage. Authorities looked at the situation but said that the incident with the ex-wife, quote, didn't raise any red flags. Now, we don't know how thoroughly they looked into the ex-wife, but we have I would say that raises some flags. Yeah. And you should look into it. But again, if she has a solid alibi, then maybe that's why they moved on. Well, and it sounds like a lot of this, a lot of these issues between him and his ex, by then they may have buried the hatchet. 
right? Because right. the 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 confrontation, the violent confrontation between the two occurred in 1998. Uh, Leanna Warner didn't go missing until 2003. Chris Warner was a heavy equipment mechanic at a nearby employer, as well as a volunteer for the ambulance service. He shared a son, Anthony Warner, with his ex-wife. Kalen was a manager at Easy Stop, a convenience store in Chisholm. There is another weird story involving Leanna and the Warners that came out. And again, investigators dismissed it as amounting to nothing. But it is a little strange. According to the Warners, and this is the Warners telling us this story, someone reported to social services that Leanna had been tied up. The Warners told the social worker investigating the complaint that Leanna was playing with neighborhood kids and they had been playing Maypole and had used Leanna as the Maypole while they wrapped a jump rope around her. It's hard to know whether social services dismissed this as a simple child's game or child's play or whether there was a file opened on the Warners. This is one of those situations where it's like you can understand if there was a misunderstanding, but you also go, okay, well, it's hard to believe that somebody would bother to report this incident if they didn't feel that there was really something here. It also seems, Captain, that we're sitting here 18 years later, and if this was a red flag, if this was something that we should really question, call into question... Mm-hmm. the people investigating the disappearance and, and the possible suspects are, are not dummies. This is not something that slips past the goalie here. This is something that would be at the top of the stack as far as information goes on the parents and something they would have looked at and something they would have questioned both Chris and Kalen about. All right, so we have this issue of question some of the behavior, question letting the child go off on her own. I think that's all fair game. So you have to wonder, could the parents have some responsibility here? Do they know what happened to their daughter? Is one guilty and not the other? All kinds of questions immediately pop up when you see these types of cases. I feel pretty confident, but it's just a guess. And it's just a gut feeling that I don't see the parents having any involvement in the disappearance of this little girl. Mm -hmm. The only involvement I see is people that were desperate to find her and went to every effort that they possibly could. If somebody had told them that they, here's something that could help your case or help you find your daughter, they did it. They didn't hold back. Well, and also with Christopher being a volunteer EMT worker, a volunteer EMT worker, that if there was some accident, they wouldn't try to cover it up. They would call call a squad and, and try to get her help immediately. Here's a couple things that I want to point out to people, too. And it doesn't seem like the general public consider the parents to be suspects either. And I think that anybody that really takes a good, hard look at this case, what you're going to see is a couple things. It looks to me that Chris was gone during the time in question. And an ambulance run at 6.20 p.m., that's a pretty ironclad alibi as far as I'm concerned. There's going to be other individuals there. There's going to be documentation of this so on and so forth. That's pretty straightforward to me. Now, we can call into question Kalen's decision-making as a parent. We can call into question the wiggle room in the timeline that the sheriff referenced. The other thing, too, you know, we're quick to point out, hey, eyewitnesses are not always great about giving you an exact time on something because they're not sitting there noting everything that happened that day and noting what time that they witnessed something. Right. So with her having this moving time of when Leanna left her site, it could be just that exact same situation. She said that we just got back from the lake. I was busy unloading the car, bringing in stuff that we purchased at these garage sales. And the kids badgering me about wanting to go to her friend's house. I really didn't want her to go there. And I told her she could go. Well, what time was that? Well, I don't know. It was after we got home from the lake. Right. Well, th- that's when that's when sometimes you can arrive at the wrong time by the encouragement of law enforcement because encur- they're encouraging you because they're telling you, look, I understand you weren't looking at the clock. I need you to ballpark this thing for me or at least give me a guess. I need something, a starting point. 
And she may have given a bad time. We were talking about a mother who's busy. The reason why I think that law enforcement did not consider them suspects and didn't consider them suspects early on is the window of time to do something to this little girl, dispose and conceal that crime takes time and effort. And I think that when they really broke down the timeline and the people that were seeing the parents interacting with the parents and the, what the eyewitness statements were that saw the little girl at five fifteen, mm-hmm. did not give a, a window of time that anybody could have done anything and covered it up. And we don't know what kind of searches that law enforcement did on their vehicles. And so if, if you have cadaver dogs sniff the vehicles, if you run some tests on the vehicles, you're going to go, well, we, we don't believe she was transported. Well, and nine times out of 10, uh, hopefully it should be 10 out of 10. This is pretty standard police protocol. But if you are responding to a call about a missing child, the first thing you ask the parents, of course, you want to know what were they wearing? When did you last see them? Da, 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 da. But one of the first actions that you actually take beyond asking questions of the parents or any person uh, that may have seen the child is ma'am, we understand that your daughter's missing. We're going to search the neighborhood. We're going to ask, you know, we're going to search the area. We need to search your home first. And that happens in in every case that I've ever reviewed. That is the first action that seems to be taken when police are responding to that type of call. Mm -hmm. And I have no reason to believe that that did not happen here. And that also could be backing the thoughts of law enforcement that these people didn't have anything to do with it. I also want to point out one big problem with the parents being guilty of anything or, 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 uh, Kalen being guilty of having done anything. They weren't the, Kalen wasn't the only person home that day. Remember her, the daughter, the other daughter Mm -hmm. was with them for the entirety of that day. She was 10 years old at that time. Now she's not an adult, obviously, but she's also not a little kid. If something bad happened, she could tell us about that. And the 10 year old daughter was active in the neighborhood search for Leanna almost immediately. Yeah. And it'd be hard to one, convince her that you have, you have to lie for mommy and two, that she would be able, have the capability to put on a a great acting show for the public. Right. And the other thing too, is both Kaylin, the daughter that was 10 years old at the time and Chris Warner have remained active in front of the media on this case for 18 years. So this 10-year-old daughter is now an adult, and she continues to do interviews about this case. So, it, again, there doesn't seem to be time for mm-hmm. anything to happen involving Kalen. Well, two kind of creepy things. And like you said, when they when they when when law enforcement shows up at the scene, they go, hey, let's search the house. But they also start asking the parents, like, did anything weird happen in the last month or so, has there been a vehicle that's been seen in the neighborhood? Has, have you seen some uh, creepy character walking around? One of the things that they said was, well, she one night when we went into Leanne's room, she was sleeping in her closet because she was afraid that the monsters outside her window were going to get her. Yeah, that's a very curious situation to this whole story and unfortunately this happens daily where a child is afraid of something and we don't know exactly what it is as a parent and most of the time it's almost always it's nothing here it's something we really call into question because of the state of this case where we have a a little girl who disappears and we can't find any trace of her. But like you said, a, a child being afraid of the monsters under her bed or the monsters under her closet, you hear that more than you hear monsters outside my window. Right. And in this situation, you do have the parents who would be later telling us that they thought that Leanna was behaving oddly in the days or maybe even weeks leading up to her disappearance, which is... Very interesting to me, and we'll dive into that some more. But while we're still talking about the parents, you know, I don't want to get accused of leaving anything out here because we do have a situation where a few months, this was uh, October, 
after their daughter went missing, we do have a violent altercation between the two parents, uh, Kaylin and Chris, where apparently Kaylin attempted to run Chris over with their vehicle. Lord almighty. They had, apparently they had some kind of disagreement earlier that day or earlier that night to which police responded to their home and settled the matter, whatever it was at the time. And then within an hour or so, this argument is now taking place in their vehicle as they're driving to which a very frustrated Chris Warner gets out of the vehicle and says that he would be walking the rest of the way home. I'm sure he probably said it in, in a different manner, but, uh, Kalen, uh, hit the gas pedal and, and took off after him in the vehicle. And he jumped out of the way. He received some scrapes, maybe a couple of bruises, but, uh, what happened was, Kalen ended up being charged with a, a misdemeanor in that case. But the police have been extremely vocal about that situation saying, look, we spoke with the couple before this happened and we spoke with them obviously afterwards. And we have Kalen who she says that the gears got jammed up and, and the, she kind of lost control of the vehicle. So she denies the saying that, you know, she denies that she attempted to hit her husband with the vehicle. Regardless of what actually happened, we have the police saying this matter and Leanna's disappearance are not connected. They are two completely separate matters. The couple was fighting. They were arguing, but they were not arguing about Leanna or anything about the case. And look, I'm not going to lie to you, Captain. This seemed very troubling to me because what it shows is angry impulsive behavior especially on Kaylin's behalf which we know well, that both she their behalves. her own word well she's the one that if 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 she's lying if the gears didn't get stuck if she didn't lose control of the car and she did try to hit her husband with the car that's the violence getting out of a vehicle and saying i'm going to walk home is not a violent act at all but what we have here is we have a person who is admittedly the last person, the last family member to see Leanna. So that really made me call a lot of things into question. But then I found this little tidbit here that made me feel completely different and go back to what my gut was telling me in the beginning that Kaylin and the family has nothing to do with this. This comes from Patty Wetterling, whose son Jacob disappeared in 1989. And when at the time when she is quoted in this article, this is 2003. So keep in mind, Jacob disappeared in 1989. And by this point in the article, he had never been found. They didn't know what happened to him. They knew he was abducted. She says in this article that she would like to discourage anyone from making a judgment about the Warners because of this particular incident. She says, quote, nobody knows what it's like to have your child missing for this long. People always ask me, did it bring us closer together? And I say, no, it's just the opposite. Jerry, who is her husband, Jerry and I went through some very hard times with so much anger, frustration, and anxiety. It's absolutely the biggest test you ever go through as a couple. It's a nightmare. Now, we know that the Wetterlings have nothing to do with what happened to their son, Jacob. They were victimized just like everybody else in that situation. And I think that what what we have Patty Wetterling telling us here is very interesting to me because this is the way that I've always kind of seen these types of situations, right? If in the Wetterling case, it was the father that decided, yeah, you guys can ride your bikes down to the video store and pick up a video. This was after mom said, no, you can't. You cannot tell me that there are not arguments between mom and dad over who's responsible, who wasn't a good parent, who didn't do their job. If he was in my care, this would have never have happened. Because you get sad, your, your heart breaks, and then you get angry. Those are natural feelings. And I have to believe in Leanna's case, Something very similar very likely happened where you get in a disagreement about this, that, or the other thing, but your heart is broken and you're hurting and you want somebody to lash out to. And it might be easy to go, you know what, mom, 
You told her she could walk down there. Why the hell would you let a five-year-old walk down there by herself? If she were with me that day, this would never have happened. And you can't tell me that that woman's not going to defend herself as a mother. So I can see this playing out exactly how it did and have nothing to do with the case and not suggest that they are guilty of anything other than being grieving parents that are hurting and heartbroken. All right, just to put a bow on this here, Captain, regarding this situation, we need to point out that Chris Warner stood by his wife, telling the media that Kalen was on edge and had reached a breaking point. He blamed this on a Montel Williams show that the two recently taped, but it had not aired yet at this point. Now, on the show, the psychic Sylvia Brown told the Warners that Leanna was murdered and buried in a shallow grave not far from their home. Chris Warner says they didn't know that that's what was going to happen during the taping of the show. They didn't know that somebody was going to tell them that they thought she was murdered and buried near their home. Remember at this point, we're just months into the case and they're still holding out hope that their daughter is alive. And I think they felt like they were blindsided by this. And they said that they left the taping feeling used and upset by the Montel Williams show. And that this was something that that created an issue between the two of the parents and it was it was just not good i mean this was they kind of felt like we're down and you're going to kick us while we're down so i think one can see quickly how these types of things can happen Right, you knuckleheads. Hey. Front and the back. Front and the back. To the windows. To the wall. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, everybody. On September 15, 2003, this is three months after Leanna disappeared, news reports began to surface about an interesting development. A man named Matthew James Curtis, age 24, had been questioned multiple times in connection with Leanna's case. Police talked to him the day after Leanna vanished and again four days later. Questions included police asking about his whereabouts and when Leanna was last seen. Curtis lived at a house near the Warners in the neighborhood. In fact, just a couple of houses down at the time that Leanna went missing. According to a news article in the Virginia MN paper, Police spoke with Curtis in the course of the investigation into Leanna, presumably because he was such a close neighbor. Whatever they learned during these interviews was enough for them to get a warrant to search his home. And when they went out to carry out this search warrant, there they found kitty porn on his computer. So Curtis was arrested, charged, and released on bail. On September 17th, Curtis was found dead of an apparent suicide. Three men were practicing archery in a gravel pit area on National Forest land and found Curtis's body. This is about eight miles from his home. Right. He was found with a plastic bag tied over his head and the cause of death after an autopsy was declared to be self-inflicted asphyxiation. The sheriff's Department said it was investigating to see whether there was any connection between the two cases and said that Curtis had never been declared an official suspect, but had never been cleared either. On the day Curtis's body was found, he was out on bail and was scheduled to appear in court for that child porn charge, but he failed to appear. He killed himself before the court appointment. The sheriff's department searched the gravel pit in Curtis's home twice, but found no signs of Leanna. What we don't know is what turned police on to Curtis in the first place. What was the basis for that search warrant? Well, at the time that Leanna went missing, there was a man that some people say maybe was in his 30s, was walking around the neighborhood, uh, described as approximately 5'10 to 6 foot, 
and had some kind of dark tattoo. So I always wondered, there was, like I said, people in the area saying that there was this suspicious guy walking in the neighborhood. Did they connect that back to Curtis? I guess that could be a possibility, but that statement from police when they're looking for the person of that description comes, it's made public after the suicide. No, after they requested the search warrant for his Mm. home. So what's difficult here is we know based off of what the police are telling us that they spoke with this Curtis character the day after Leanna went missing. And then again, four days later. Okay. So some, so we can just assume that something within that questioning made him go. Something's not right here. That's what I'm thinking. Captain. I agree with that. Something during the course of them stepping foot into his home or standing on his front doorstep and asking him questions, told them this guy, his home is of interest to us specifically in this Leanna case. And that could be something as simple as this guy seemed extremely nervous when we were asking him that day after that she was missing. Right. Or he couldn't tell us where he was or had no alibi or he was sweating profusely or he told us something on day one and then told us something different on day four. It could really be any number of things. But the thing that's crazy here is that when they do get that search warrant, they search his home, they filed child pornography on his computer. Well, that doesn't look very good, especially when this dude lives just a few doors down from the Warners. Yeah. I never like it when there's a suicide No, in the sense of we don't have answers then. And my gut always goes towards this suspect. You commit suicide. You're you're so distraught about what you did. You can't even live with yourself. And suicide is not a obvious sign of guilt. Doesn't necessarily mean that he felt guilty or or Mm -hmm. did something to Leanna. I mean, really, he could have killed himself for any number of reasons. And he's not around to tell us why he did so. We do have the Warners... Leanna's parents who say, hey, you know, we saw this guy around the neighborhood, but never saw uh, Leanna interacting with him. And we didn't personally know him. I do know that police continue to look into Curtis postmortem. They did admit, shamefully admitted that it would have been desirable for them to have talked to him some more, mm-hmm. which possibly they, they were going to do that after he was charged or convicted. We don't know. But of course, now they will never get the chance to do so. We do know that the Minnesota BCA confiscated Matthew James Curtis's truck after he killed himself and processed it for forensic evidence of Leanna's presence to see if, you know, they could find any proof that she had ever been inside his vehicle. Right. Uh, This did include DNA and fingerprints and fibers and hairs They couldn't find any trace of Leanna having ever been in that truck, but we do need to point out this was after Matthew James Curtis's death, which took place in September. Leanne Warner went missing the 14th of June. So there would have been plenty of time for one to clean this vehicle if one needed to do so. Well, like I was saying to me, when there's a suicide in a case, you know, take like the Amy Mihalovic case, when there's a suspect that, takes their own life my gut points to that that suspect but here is a different case because he's found because when they're investigating this missing girl case they find this individual we don't know what led them i'm guessing like we were talking about before when they're interviewing him he says something not correctly Mm -hmm. or maybe just acts strangely and then when they when they do get the search warrant, they find child pornography, and that could be enough for this individual to say, "Hey, look, my life's not going right. I maybe have this. I'm, I'm a sick individual for looking at this stuff. I have these urges that I'm trying to control, and, mm-hmm. and that's why he took his life." So there are types out there that have these fantasies, urges, whatever you want to call them, desires, and they never act on them. Mm-hmm. I mean, we just don't know. Again, it's a situation. I'm with you, Captain. It's you hate the suicides one uh, for any. You know, you hate the suicide for 
a million different reasons, but one of the big reasons, especially in this case, is that it creates another mystery in this case. It creates one less person to talk to. And in my opinion, this guy in, in, in the humble goat garage opinion here, Captain, this Matthew James Curtis guy, I would put him in the top three of suspects in this case. Now, that's going to lead us to another top three suspect. And this is an individual that I despise. One of the most hated men on the planet as far as my mind goes. That's not a nice way to talk about me. This is a guy that we've spoke about several times here in the garage, and I never enjoy talking about him. I'm talking about Joseph Edward Duncan III. So we're going to jump ahead two years in this case to July of 2005. Now, of course, Leanna's case is continuing to be worked at this time, but meanwhile, in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, investigators captured suspected murderer and sex offender Joseph E. Duncan. He was charged with the abduction of eight-year-old Shasta Groney and suspected of murdering Shasta's 13-year-old brother, mother, boyfriend, and missing nine-year-old brother, Dylan. Now, you may remember for the longtime listeners joining us here in the garage today, you may recall that we covered this case in our fifth nail episodes. The fifth nail was a blog, basically an online rant written by Joseph Duncan in which he published his rambling fantasies and dark thoughts. He also talked about his love for computers. You may also recall that Duncan served time in prison for the rape of a 14 year old Tacoma, Washington boy. When Duncan was just 16 years old himself. He was released in 2000. So how does Duncan's case possibly tie into Leanna's case? Chief Erickson said that federal investigators were tracing Joseph Duncan's movements over the past few years because of a posting on his fifth nail blog that appeared on January 4th, 2004. In fact, this post was the first of the fifth nail blog. Duncan wrote that Learning about Leanna's case was, quote, the proverbial last straw that led him to start his blog to rant about the stigma of being a convicted sex offender. Yeah, because that's what we want to hear about. He does not mention Leanna by name, and it seems that he felt the need to construct an alibi for the time that Leanna went missing. Mm. The exact words of the post were, quote, just found out that a five-year-old girl went missing from Chisholm, Minnesota on June 14, 2003. I did not even know until today this happened. So I have tried to figure out what I was doing that day since I'm always afraid of getting accused when something like this happens, end quote. The Post said that Duncan wanted to be sure that he figured out his whereabouts in June of 2003 when Leanna vanished so that he wouldn't be accused of being the one that abducted her. He says he was doing this for his own safety and wrote, I figure it is just a matter of time before I am falsely accused of some crime or another. Well, yes, you will be accused. I don't know if it will be falsely in several different cases. We know, Captain, just to for the people that didn't listen to the fifth nail, he was convicted of all those crimes he was accused of yeah, I mean, or this, thought to have done this guy has a dirt bag he's an animal he basically murdered a whole family so he could abduct the two youngest children and he had those kids with him for a long period of time where he tormented and tortured the kids yeah thankfully one of them was found alive and is still alive and doing well to this day all these years later, another thing to be thankful about is they were able to tie Joseph Duncan to some other homicides. And I suspect he's probably done others that we are unaware of. Duncan was not the type to admit to any of his crimes. He was the type that one, he would like to play games, mind games and torment and tease the police and the public and the media. And I think that was a big part of the reason why he created his blog so he could do that from behind prison walls. The other thing, too, is that when you did finally convict him of something, he would go out of his way to explain to the public that the victims were not so innocent themselves, that they had some blame in this. And he blamed some of the victims that he killed for their own deaths, which is just completely bizarre and demonic behavior, in my opinion. 
Thankfully, we can sit here in the garage today and raise a glass real high because Joseph Duncan passed away last year, and I hope he enjoyed every minute of it. Now, Chief Erickson stated in this case that there was nothing specific tying Duncan to Leanna, but did say it's very suspicious that he brought the case up on his blog. In fact, if we are to believe Joseph Duncan, he says that the case is what started the whole blog to begin with. Blog, more like clog. I Again, Duncan's a hard guy to get to put your finger on. I don't know if he would do this as something just simply to taunt. I'm never putting my finger on him. Police or Leanna's family. Mm -hmm. I also don't think that he's above enjoying being suspected of crimes he didn't commit. Yeah, it's attention seeking device. Exactly. Yeah. You're exactly. Well, looks like you just put your finger on him. Well, I'm not. Uh, I told you I'm not going to touch that son of a bitch. Duncan says that he, according to his records, that he was able to figure out what he claims to have been doing that day was watching some co-workers parachute and that he did some shopping mm -hmm. but could not find any receipts, which makes sense. He's locked up. Anyway, Duncan did live in Fargo, North Dakota, and was when he was arrested on the Groney case. But he was wanted on child molestation charges stemming from an incident in Detroit Lakes, Minnesota in 2004. Now, Fargo, North Dakota is much closer to Detroit Lakes, Minnesota than it is to Chisholm, Minnesota. And in fact, much closer to Detroit Lakes than Detroit Lakes is to Chisholm, Minnesota, if that makes sense. Uh, Duncan was arrested for molesting a six-year-old boy on a playground in Detroit Lakes, which is about a three-hour drive from Chisholm, Minnesota. Now, I do want to point out the other crimes that he did, he would have had to drive a long distance to do so. So I can't, I cannot completely just go, all right, he, he says he was doing this on that day and the distance between him and where this disappearance took place. I don't think any of that rules him out. In fact, there was uh, one person who's done some good gangbusters work here an online, an online sleuther that posted that a treasure hunt winner found a treasure hunt winner log of a camping and scuba trip putting Joseph Duncan in Crosby, Minnesota in August of 2003. So this is interesting. It's, it's not, you know, it would be weeks away from the disappearance, but it puts him much closer in proximity to Chisholm, Minnesota. And it lists Jet Duncan mm -hmm. on this treasure hunt winner log Joseph Duncan called himself Jet Duncan. He won a snorkel mask and defogger in that contest. By July 21st of 2005, investigators stated publicly that they had cleared Duncan of any possible involvement in Leanna's disappearance. I have no idea how or why they reached this conclusion. The best that I can think of, Captain, they we know that investigators seized video footage that Duncan took the day of his coworker skydiving. So there that's not in question. He he was there and witnessed these people skydiving at some point. The timestamp shows that they were diving in the afternoon. The airport where the dive took place is about a four hour drive from Chisholm. I would like to see that exact timestamp. Mm -hmm. I would like to interview those people, his coworkers. Can we determine 100% that he was where he was when that timestamp says? Could he have altered that timestamp in any manner? Right. Those are just the, the questions that I have. Again, he's such a, a horrible and despicable person. I think if he's talking about a case and he's putting himself on your radar – you cannot remove him from your radar until you need de definitive proof. Yeah, because like we said, this guy's a animal. He's very capable of abducting a child. That would That's actually low on his list of what he's capable of. You almost need the word of God to tell you that he did not do this for, for me to remove him. He's, mm -hmm. I, I'd like to move on from him now because I, I'm just sick of thinking about him, if that's okay with you, Captain. Well, you're the GOAT. Because this is going to bring us to another bah. story and probably the strangest portion of this case in my mind. This this actually 
gives me nightmares. In 2006, some more information came to light, and this was not news to the family. This news is going to come from the family because they say this is actually something that they discussed with investigators, but the investigators didn't seem to agree with them that this was an interesting avenue to investigate. The family decided at some point, well, you know what? We're just going to tell the public about this. We've told investigators about this. No, you know, I don't know if they have done stuff. The investigators, I don't know if they did anything with this information or not. They've never referenced it. But the parents say that the investigators did not seem interested in this information. So now we're going to put it out to the public and tell the world. Chris and Kaylin Warner went on the Maury Povich show. This is October of 2006. And they decided that this information was worth disclosing after three years of it being largely ignored or given no credence by police. Leanna, they said, one day came home with a case filled with Barbie dolls and clothing for the Barbie dolls, but would only tell her parents that she, that she had got them from a little old lady. Furthermore, a week before she vanished, their little daughter had packed up a suitcase and said she was going to go live with her new family at her new family's house. This was around the same time that she started sleeping in the closet, telling her father that there were monsters outside of her window. Yeah, to come home and see your daughter playing with maybe a, a doll, right? And saying somebody gave it to her. Okay, maybe a garage sale in the neighborhood. Maybe she was playing with a doll at her friend's house. Parents said, hey, just take this. But when there's a doll and there's a case filled with dolls and clothes, multiple items, and all she can say is it came from a little old lady, that's it's pretty creepy. Well, yeah. And let's go back to, you know, we referenced an online sleuther putting up some information about uh, Duncan and his possible whereabouts, you know, in August of 2003. There was a person, a woman who posted on Tapa Talks website under the Leanna Warner discussion group that says that she was about 12 years old at the time when Leanna went missing and was a sitter, a regular sitter for Leanna. She tells a story that once at the park with Leanna, that Leanna had told her she was going on a trip without her parents. Now, Again, this is something that somebody's posting online. I can't verify that this person was an actual babysitter for Leanna. I can't verify that this story took place. It does seem to line up with some information that Leanna's parents are saying that they said in 2006. So I found that to be incredibly interesting. The thing that this really reminds me of here, Captain, is, is a case that we've discussed here in the garage the Asia degree case out of North Carolina. This is where Asia seems to have taken off on foot in the middle of the night. We don't know where she was going or why, but she disappears. We've never found any trace of her. The only thing that they found after she went missing was a strange photo of another little girl. And this photo's never been identified. There's never been anybody that came forward that said, Oh, I was that person in the photo, or I was the person that gave Aisha that photo. Right. So to me, that photo will always be tied to her disappearance and the reason, possible reason for her leaving her home that night. And then in this case, very same situation, right? It, it's, it seems very similar to me, Captain, where we have the parents telling the public, you know, somebody gave our daughter all these Barbie dolls and all the clothing to go with these Barbie dolls. We ask her where she got them. Some little old lady gave them to her. We've never, that was in 2006. Let me check my calendar. It's 2021. We've never had anybody come forward and say, I was that person that gave her those dolls. I, I, you know, they were used to be my daughters. My right. kid had grown up. I had them laying around. I was going to throw them out or I was going to put them in a, up in a garage sale. I saw the little kid gave them to her. There's never been anybody come forward and say, or people come forward and say, oh, I know who gave them to her. You know, it, there's no answer to this question. 
Well, that's why it reminds me of the John Bonet Ramsey case because day John Bonet Ramsey goes missing, she t- is telling people that Santa Claus is coming to visit her after Christmas. It's just one of those weird stories where you're never going to get that out of your head. Where, why is this little girl playing with, like you said, it's a collection of dolls and a collection of clothes for those dolls. Who was this little old lady? Did the little old lady even exist? Because these individuals that abduct children, and thank God it's such a rare crime, but even these individuals that groom children or molest them or try to groom them into some kind of bizarro relationship, they're very manipulative. They're very in tune to how to trick these kids. It's much easier for them if they can get and convince the kid to go along with whatever it is that the adult wants to do willingly rather than kicking and screaming. It doesn't have to be a little old lady. I'm, I'm with you. I want to know who the little old lady is. But then I also wonder, could it have been a 20-something-year-old man or a 30-something-year-old man that says, oh, if anybody asks where you got these, right. you know, I don't want to have to come and take them from you. If mom and dad or mom finds out that you got them from me, you're going to get in trouble. Right. You just tell them that you got them from a little old lady. Here's the other thing that's interesting, too, to me. We know that both of Leanna's parents came from, they were, they were married before they were married to each other. If I'm an outsider and I'm viewing this situation or I have any idea of that, oh, you got, you got brothers and sisters that have other families? Well, guess what, little Leanna? You have another family, too, just like your brothers and sisters. You've just not met them yet. And here's a gift from one of your family members. Yeah, but there's also sickos that want to want to steal children and raise them as their own. They, yeah. They see this precious, beautiful little girl and they go, I want her. I want her to be mine. And that's equally possible. I think, Captain, you and I, we stand in agreement here that these three scenarios are of the most interest to us. Yeah, I agree. These individuals, Joseph Edward Duncan, who for no rhyme or reason decides to discuss the case on his blog. We certainly know the horrific acts that he is capable of. Right. We have the guy that lives just a couple doors down. That's caught with child pornography in his home. And he during the course of questioning, he goes from being a possible witness to somebody that police have such an interest in that they get a search warrant to search his home. And that's when they find the child pornography in his house. Yeah. And that is Matthew James Curtis. And then this weird story about Leanna having another family or going to live with her other family and receiving this gift from a quote unquote little old lady is really bizarre stuff. I think those three things to me in this case where you have a lot of questionable behavior and a lot of persons of interest, and we've discussed a lot of those, those three for me sit at the top of my list as far as the disappearance to Leanna Warner. Well, and don't forget about the monsters outside her window that are going to come take her away. Leanna's parents, Chris and Kaylin, have moved away from the home in Chisholm that Leanna lived in with them. They say that this decision was very hard for them and that they were worried that she might not be able to find them should she return. But it seems after 18 years of holding on to hope on the basis of nothing, reality has prevailed. They still leave the porch light on, though. Cases like the solving of Jacob Wetterling's abduction and the three Ohio women found in Ariel Castro's basement continue to give them hope. And the fact that no trace of Leanna was found in the thorough and painstaking searches of a wide radius makes part of them believe that she was taken out of the area and possibly could still be alive. Most likely, Chris Warner believes that she may be a victim of a black market abduction. 2021 marks 18 years since Leanna vanished. 
The now Chisholm police chief believes that Leanna was abducted and investigators and law enforcement have said the same thing within a week or so of the case. That They believe this is one of those rare cases of stranger abduction. They still consider this to be very much an open case, but everyone is incredibly frustrated because there seems to be nothing to go on. In 2013, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released an age progression picture of what Leanna might look like at the age of 15 and continues to issue flyers and posters about Leanna. As always, we want to hear from you on any of the episodes that we covered. We want to hear your thoughts and opinions because we know you guys are no dum-dums. No dum-dum heads here in the garage. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading? Uh, Yes, we do, Captain. A little recommended reading. Also, maybe a little more of the recommended listening. This week, we are recommending They Call Me Baba Booey. We're going to step outside of true crime and have a little fun This is for anyone that's a Howard Stern fan. I highly recommend the audio version of They Call Me Baba Booey by the great Gary Delabate. You can find that recommendation as well as many others on our website, truecrimegarage.com. Some say it's the best book ever written. Some say that. And until next week, be be good, good, be kind, and don't litter.